Father God, we just thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and you died for us. Thank you, Lord, that your name is power. Your name is just able to break into every situation. Lord, I just pray for each one of us that we would know a fresh sense of you. Lord, come and speak with us. Come and highlight things as I talk, Lord. Lord, I pray that people would hear your words and not mine. Thank you, God. So as Ben said, um, we're, sorry, I'm just looking at where I can walk to. Um, <laughs> and we're continuing our series on uh, the church. And, um, you know, Ben and I have an idea about um, what we believe church is and where we believe we want to see the church go, where God's leading us. Um, but as we talk, I want to encourage you to think about where you see the church going. You know, sort of all of these um, preachers that Ben's brought sort of have been amazing. And, you know, sort of God can speak to you about who he's calling you to be within the church. Um, because the church isn't just something that we come along to, um, that we uh, sort of participate in, um, it's something that we can get involved in. Um, so this morning we're uh, talking about generosity. We're going to read as we have every week, this week, uh, every time uh, through this series, we're going to read Acts 2. And I thought I would just change it up and bring it from a different translation. So I thought I would uh, bring it out of the Passion Translation, um, which is just a bit like the message. It just brings slightly different wording. Um, it's not always sort of 100% accurate, but sort of um, it's good to provoke. So Acts 2, verse 42 to... 47, every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Daily, they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. So I guess my first question when I was preparing was, what is generosity? It's a word that we sort of throw around, um, but what does it actually mean? If you look it up in the dictionary, it speaks about kindness. But I kind of feel it's more than that. It's a, a sharing of um, something that you have. One of the things that so often when we talk out of that verse, we can glaze over it because it, it gets this negative press that um, they were almost in this commune. Um, but the whole point about that verse or those verses is that they didn't do this out of compulsion. 
They didn't do this because they needed to. They did it because God was prompting them to be generous. It reminds me of an experiment that was conducted at Stanford University. And actually the experiment was planned for something different. It was uh, planned to see how kids um, could um, delay their gratification, so to speak. And they were given one marshmallow and told, you can have that marshmallow, it is yours, and you can eat it now. But if you wait a minute, you'll get two marshmallows. And that's the kind of God that we've got, is that we've got a God who loves to give us things. Um, and we can always have more of what God has for us. I want perhaps to lead off where Ben left us last week, that the ultimate generous gift that God gave us was salvation. That he sent Jesus, who was in heaven and had everything, and Jesus left all of that, left all his um, things that he had up in heaven to come uh, down to earth and to show us um, who God truly is and how we can be in a relationship with him. He um, was able to beat um, the powers of darkness and set us into a right place with God. And that is the ultimate form of generosity. You know, God could so easily have just abandoned us um, and left us um, because God made us in the first place. Um, but he didn't do that. He wanted us to be back in relationship with him. Another thing I think of when I think about generosity is my arm. I was a young lad of 18, came away to university, not far from here, just in Preston, and um, I'd actually moved up from Suffolk, and I was a little family boy, for want of a better sort of word. I um, just enjoyed being around in my family. Um, and so coming away to university was quite hard. And my aunt got to hear about that, and she lives in, Preston, in Chorley. And she would come each weekend, pick me up, and take me back to hers. She'd feed me, she'd give me a bed for the night, and it just made that transition so much easier into living alone and living sort of a student lifestyle. Um, and she did that as long as I needed it. And she'd come up and pick me up and she'd come and um, sort of take me back to hers. She'd go and pick up my nana um, and we could all spend the weekend together. And I got that bonus of family life, but still able to live that student life elsewhere. Kind of already alluded to this, but the first point to start with is that God is generous. And that um, Jesus came down and demonstrated this um, at the wedding of Cana. Um, it tells us about this in John 2, and I've switched back now to the, the New International Version. So, um, His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water, water pots meant to be used for Jewish washing rituals. Each one could hold about 20 gallons or more. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, 
now draw out, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. I wonder when that water turned into wine. I wonder, you know, those servants must have had an amazing amount of faith. Either that or they were ready to be ridiculed uh, for just presenting the master of ceremonies with a load of water. Um, but, uh, so they tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What's interesting is that Jesus gave those wedding guests the very best. Um, it would have been lovely, I'm sure, to taste that wine, um, get a bit of heaven here on earth. Um, but being the geek that I am, I looked at the, the sort of numbers and those um, ceremonial jars, six of them, would have held about 120 gallons to 180 gallons, something like that. Um, now, if you work that out in bottles, that's about 700 to 1,000 plus bottles of wine. Wow. You just think, and okay, what I should say is weddings in, those, in that area, in those times, were not like weddings we experience here. Okay, so weddings here, uh, you know, an afternoon, maybe a day, um, sort of, but there it was, you know, typically a week. It, it certainly ran over multiple days. And it was considered very poor if you ran out of wine um, to sort of give you guests. And so Jesus comes to the rescue with between 700 and 1,000 bottles of wine. I'm sure it was enough to sort of complete through the wedding. But not just any wine, it was the very best wine. And this is part of what God does, you know. If you've not seen The Chosen, you can download an app on your phone and um, watch this uh, in season one, episode five. It works through the wedding of Cana. Um, and it's really interesting just seeing the joy that's expressed at weddings and how Jesus was part of it, but also that sort of um, generosity of prov provision. So God is generous. And we're disciples of Jesus. We're meant to be more like Jesus, more like God, as we develop. And so we're, if you like, students of generosity. Jesus was teaching and a, a rich man came up to him um, and he said, what good, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, I don't know quite why he was coming up uh, to Jesus, whether he was looking for a rubber stamp of who he was or whether he was genuinely interested. But there was something that was clearly lacking in his life. And Jesus responded with, well, you keep the commandments. So you, you look through the Torah and you keep those commandments that are sort of there. And the guy goes, well, I've done all of that, I've kept those, so what else must I do? And Jesus answered this way, he said, if you want to be perfect, and I've been going through some counseling that has been sort of saying, you know, we should aim for perfection, but you can't be perfect, you'll never achieve being perfect. 
But Jesus' answer says, if you want to be perfect, go away, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then, come and follow me. So, he's come to seek Jesus' advice on how to get eternal life. Um, and Jesus, if you like, sets the bar very high. And we don't know what happened later on with that guy, whether he actually did sell his possessions and go and follow Jesus. But what we do know is in that moment, he actually went away very sad. And he sort of said, well, I've got loads of stuff to sell. I'm really, you know, I've invested a lot of money. But what is important is that we follow Jesus, that we follow what he tells us to do. It's why Jesus, in part, sent his Holy Spirit, was that we would have somebody who would um, tell us sort of what to do. Um, but when Jesus tells us to do things like sell all our possessions, it can be quite a challenge to do that, particularly here. But that's what Jesus is calling us to do, and he will provide for us. So we shouldn't be afraid of what Jesus is going to tell us to do. And another story is the, the widow's offering, and uh, she drops in two pennies uh, into the offering at the temple. And um, from that, I just want to say, Jesus picked up that she had um, given far more, relatively, than all the other people who were just making a show of giving. And um, Jesus... The, the point that I took away from Jesus' teaching there is that it doesn't actually matter how much you give. What matters is whether you've done what you feel called to do. That's the sign of generosity. It's not what you give, it's almost what you've got left, and it's what you've been asked to do. So let's get practical. Quite often we think about generosity, we think about money, we think about possessions. But there's loads of other ways we can be generous. You know, just before lockdown um, initiated, before the pandemic, we were just getting into the swing of meeting together for food and sharing food together. And that's an excellent way that we can be generous to one another. We can be generous in the way that we love. We can be generous with our time. What skills do you have? What giftings has God given you? There's, we talked last week about you know, the setup and takedown and just um, sort of the kids' work. Andrea's out there now with the kids. That as we begin meeting together, more and more of these things are going to need doing. And maybe God's given you, given you a gifting of being able to work with the youth. Or maybe, like me, he's given you a gifting of being able to fix computers. Um, in fact, sometimes it feels like I just need to look at them and they sort themselves out. But however frustrating that is for other people. But... One of the things you can definitely be generous with is your time in prayer and spending time praying for people. Not just for those here in the church, but for those that we're praying for to come to know Jesus. I just want to say again, um, I know a number of you did write down some names of people and Claire mentioned someone earlier. Um, it would be great if you could send those names to Ben so that when we meet on Wednesdays to pray, we've got actual names that we can lift up before Jesus to um, see come um, to him. So um, I'm trying to work out where I'm at. 
And one of the things that, that is always in the back of my mind when I, I serve is that, that fear of me um, getting locked into doing PA or getting locked into um, to fixing computers. But try and work your way through that and walk away from it because one of the things that um, Matthew 25, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said um, that when we help others, we are in fact doing it as though we're helping Jesus and that we would be known by God because we'd actually helped Jesus in other people. And so I want to encourage you, just look to um, help those around you and don't worry about sort of getting locked into things. Luke 12, Jesus again was saying, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. The other thing, I've already said this, but God intends for us to give joyfully, not out of compulsion. Um, that's in Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians. The final thing, this week, if you've been following Bible in one year, Nicky Gumbel was talking about generosity and about reaping and sowing. And I just want to say, you reap what you sow, you reap later than you sow, and you reap more than you sow. And those are amazing principles to live by. Um, I've been challenged sort of over the last week just in how I consider things. I was at a junction there yesterday and a car went for a lane that he wasn't meant to take. And he and I came very close together and then split apart. And my natural reaction is, you're in the wrong, get out of my way. But actually, the generous thing is, yeah, I can easily see how you made that mistake. And it's fine. You know, we were able to sort of sort it out. And, you know, that's, that's generous living where... We aren't focused on ourselves, but we focus on those around us. Finish, because we've talked about reaping, with John 4, verse 35. Jesus says, Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. There's an opportunity to be generous with our neighbours and for us to um, lift people up and allow God to work through our kindness, through our generosity to our neighbours. With that, I shall leave it. Didn't make 20 minutes. Kind of knew I wasn't going to, but want to say have a good week. Bless you. Um, look to those that you can bless and be generous to. And, uh, yeah, we are meeting on Wednesday for prayer. Um, so if you're able to make that, it's a great time just to come together, to worship God together and to pray. Um, and if you're not able to do that, have a good week, and I will see you next week. All being well.